Well, I'm starting. Okay. I think we should start. Hello, everyone. Welcome to second Think Twice conference in Istanbul. Let me introduce myself. I am. My name is Arif Yildirim. I am an assistant professor. Uh, sorry. I'm an assistant professor and we start to work to make this conference happen from April, from Paris to now and now we are here. I would like to thank some people who are really helpful for us uh, to make it happen. On behalf of the university actually I want to start Professor Dr. Jan Bilgili and the crew from the University, Beyza Nur Kalaycı, Gizem Güler, Sena Aydın, Ece Kızor, Selahattin Nizam. We are so thankful for, for them to help us. And also, my special thanks to Mr. Anders Krape uh, for doing miracles. <laughs> and of course, Norwegian Pirate Party. Ula, Tala, and Quan from Belgium, thanks for the ISSN. And of course, my research assistant and my friend Hakan, I really appreciated your effort. And of course, there's a company, Gabar Soft, uh, who are sponsored for the publication of Proceeding Book. We also thankful for them too. And finally, and lastly, all the speakers and you, all people who made to be here, we are so grateful to you. As we struggle for a more horizontal and free planet and in the Tivoli Age Human Society, we shall continue our discoveries in the future by following sailors. So I kindly invite Rico Brewer for commercial threats to financial independence and what to do with them. Please, Rico. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see if I can get my PowerPoint on here. Yeah, if you could do that. We have And here. All right. So thank you, Pirate Party International, for allowing me. Oh, here's the microphone. Thank you, Pirate Party International, for allowing me to be here, and uh, thank you, Pirates in the Netherlands. So I only teamed up with Pirates in the Netherlands this spring, and I'm in Istanbul. So that goes to show you, if you get off the couch, things can move, right? So I, I only arrived in Istanbul this morning at five or so. <laughs> so. Um, if this story sounds incoherent at places, then uh, it's probably sleep deprivation on my part, yeah? so bear with me on that one. And also, this is going to be finance and macro e macroeconomics. Uh, anybody falls asleep, it's going to be me yeah, in the next hour. So, uh, I'm going to talk to you about debt and how that involves, uh, how, how that has an effect on your individual freedom, which is a topic that, that pirates care deeply about. So first off, a few examples on that, and then later I'll, I'll talk you through uh, how that caused the crisis of 2008 and where we are today, and then look ahead. Okay. So debt, and first off on that list would be uh, student debt. So if you want to make a little something for yourself, I would say uh, the social contract, or the way our society works is you, you take out a student loan, right? You go to university like, like like we are here in, in Istanbul. Uh, you take out a loan and you drag that thing with you through life. In the Netherlands, uh, uh, a new law was passed this year that greatly increased the amount of money that students had to loan in order to, to get a proper education. Uh, in the United States, the student debt is through the roof the last couple of years. So the amount of money people need to borrow to get that university degree, to, to get that on their resume, to, to, to get to that job interview and try to make something for themselves, 
the, 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 the debt level has increased. Now that may not be bad, I have no opinion on that part, but if you make it to your first job interview, uh, chances are that that job is going to be less hours or maybe a little less pay. Chances are you're not going to find that job. Uh, there's a lot of youth unemployment currently. So there's your first example of how debt levels uh, impact students. So I paid mine off a long time ago. I'm from 1970, this is when I was born, so that was not an issue. Second example I want to pose here before I move on into the, the second leg of this, this story is, uh, is mortgage debt. Right. So I bought my house, my wife and me, we bought our house in, uh, in 2007. And that thing has been losing value ever since. Right. So in the Netherlands, housing prices were rising right, for 15 years straight. And I bought that thing in 2007. It's been losing value for six, seven years straight. So the value of that underlying property has decreased by, I don't know, 60,000 euros. That wasn't the deal when I bought that thing. Uh, again, uh, I, I, I signed that contract, right? I made a conscious decision buying the thing. But had I known, I might have made a different decision. Now, the issue I take with that is that currently people are buying houses again as well. And currently we're telling those young people that it's a good time to buy a house. We're even helping them. If you look at the United Kingdom, there's help to buy, reinflating that housing bubble. The Netherlands has a similar law that helps people buy their first home. Uh, we might have hit bottom. I would argue differently. And I have a few illustrations here with me. That's uh, you carrying your student debt through life or your mortgage debt. That's the way that thing might feel. And that's housing prices in the Netherlands. So if you look, take a good look at 2007, that was me. And then all the way to the right is where we are today. So they tell people that I think it's going to rise again, right? If you take a long-term perspective, I don't know, right? So you're, the society is trying to get you to take out that student loan. That's good for you. You get an education. Uh, trying to get you to get into, uh, into, into mortgage debt. It's good for you. Buy a house. Invest in yourself is what they say. It doesn't feel like that. In, uh, in my personal example. Third example of, of debt, before I move on, is, is government debt, right? So I was born in 1970, and the Netherlands already had a, had a state debt, which is serviced through taxes. Right? I mean, you pay your taxes, and the money is used to pay the interest on that national debt. Uh, now, I try to pay off my debts. My country does not, and neither does to many of the other countries. I have a graph on that as well. So there you go. I'm from 1970, and that's the state debt of the Netherlands. And that thing that was a bit of a line, right, all the way, uh, right until, right until 1970, is all, all, all of a sudden way up here. And I'm gonna go to the crisis of 2008 and what's happening after that. That's where that thing goes vertical, right? So this is the Netherlands, supposedly one of the richer countries in Europe or in the world. And this is the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve in the United States. This is not their state debt, but this is the money issued by what, what, what goes uh, as a central bank in the United States. So all really good and well right until 2008 when the thing went vertical. Now, I bought my house and I see what's happening to, to student loans and everything. And I see this thing happening. I want to extrapolate. So where's this thing leading us? And that's where I'm becoming a bit bored. And that's what led me to write my piece for Think Twice. So thanks again for the invitation. That's why I'm here, talking about this thing. So where's this thing going? Um, now, state debt is a bit of a special one in, the, in this, in this uh, uh, list of, of, uh, of debt. <coughs> because I was born into debt, right, 1970. Oh. Go back to the Dutch one. There was there was debt already, and my parents were, were servicing debt with their taxation. Now, through my lifetime, that thing has dramatically increased. And probably when I die, I'll, I'm, my generation passes on a lot of debt to my children. Now, there's a word for that, right? And I want to write, uh, read a little quote from Wikipedia on this. So the word would be debt bondage, right? 
Debt bondage has been described by the United Nations as a form of modern day slavery. Debt bondage or debt slavery or bonded labor is a person's pledge of their labor or services as security for repayment of a debt or other obligation. Debt bondage is what you would use to describe slavery. So a bit of a dra dramatic uh, comparison maybe. Uh, but yeah, that thing is going up. So uh, where is that going to lead us? So that got me thinking earlier this year. And then I saw Think Twice conference coming by. And I thought, well, let's make a little story on that. And I heard somebody make the comparison between uh, Titanic and our global economy. And I'm going to use that as a hook, right? So bear with me with this metaphor. Let's look at our global economy as if it were Titanic. So when was the thing built? Anybody know here? Yeah, uh, earlier. Yeah, that's that's the still I don't know that by heart. So that's all we need, right? You got we got Google for that. So uh, yeah, early 20th century, and it sailed in 1912. Incidentally, in 1913, the Federal Reserve Bank of the United States, or the Federal Reserve Law in the United States was passed. So they're both right around the same time. Titanic sailed in 1912. It was constructed uh, in a few years before that, right? So there you go. Again, thanks for sharing. I don't know if the thing's copyrighted at all. Uh, Okay, so that's the Titanic 1911 or something, and this is the Federal Reserve System in the United States being instituted the day before Christmas of 1913, when a third of Congress was already home. It's interesting, right? day before Christmas you pass a law that's been with us for the last hundred years. So Federal Reserve is basically a private-owned bank, but it, it, it uh, performs the duties of a central bank of a country, and the thing was passed into law in 1913. Well, Titanic sank. Uh, that thing's still with us. Oh, is this thing working? There you go. Titanic sailed in 1912. Now, I'm pretty sure that Captain of Titanic knew it was really not unsinkable when it sailed. And I'm also pretty sure Captain of Titanic knew that thing was not constructed in, 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 a, in an unsinkable manner, right? Construction materials may not have been what they were made to be. And I would argue that the same goes for uh, the people that instituted the Federal Reserve Banking System in, in the United States. But it's still nonetheless. And you know what captains say when, when there's an issue, right? So carry on as you were, nothing to worry about. Well, I think Titanic hit some floating ice before it went under. As did the uh, United States. So this is my first example of some floating ice that our global economy might have encountered. 1933, the possession of gold was made illegal in the United States. So people owned some gold coins maybe. You had to sell that back to your, to your country. And then when all that gold was collected, they increased the price of that thing. So basically, uh, you could argue that they stole value from, their, from the citizens and, and the possession of gold was made illegal in the United States. So that's 1933, some floating ice. This is a, this is, a warning, if you will, that um, the global economy was, wasn't doing all that well at that time. This was a measure during the Great Depression, right? I mean, Second World War hadn't even started yet. So they were in some troubles and they confiscated wealth trying to get their way out of that. So in the next image, if that thing works, yeah, there you go. You see a little dent right on right, 1933. that thing, little bitty floating ice. So you see where that line drops? This is actually uh, the amount of gold that a dollar can buy, that the United States dollar can buy. So when, as long as that thing is connected to the gold standard, uh, you get a flat line, right? So that's, that's real purchasing power. Now, right in the 70s, something happened over there. You see that? So that's when the dollar got disconnected from something solid. Now, before that, uh, after World War II, Some countries got together and decided on a world trade system, right? And the, and the strongest currency that was around was the US dollar. So they decided they'd do trading in the dollar. It was connected to gold, so that was convenient. Right until the 70s when, when yeah, well, I suppose war maybe more than anything made, made them overspend. 
and people owning dollars went to the United States. So, well, here's the dollars. I'd have some. I'd rather have some gold. Thank you. Right. So that didn't, wasn't going to work. So the Nixon administration took the uh, dollar off the gold standard. And you see what that does to the purchasing power. Now this is where we are today, right there on the bottom. So that's some mighty big chunk of floating ice right there in the 70s. Okay. But we went full speed ahead anyway. I'm pretty sure Nixon administration did the same thing as what they did when they uh, confiscated gold, right? Carry on as you were, nothing to worry about, we've got it under control. That's what they tend to tell you. So economy went full speed ahead, and I grew up in the best of times, for the Netherlands anyway, the 70s and 80s was very relaxed. So that was good. Right until 2000, when you had that dot, dot com bubble that burst. And before that, some, some, some serious inflation that you saw in the graph just a moment ago, with purchasing power dropping and interest rates rising. But we went full speed ahead anyway, and uh, in 2000, dot com bubble crashed. I was working for an IT company at the time, but which went public, so I got some options for free, and then they went through the roof, and I was very rich for a while. <laughs> no, not world alive. <laughs> but it's similar, similar graph, I suppose. I didn't buy them. I was happy to have them, and they went through the roof, and then they went through the floor, and I was back normal again. So that was my experience on the stock market. Never met, went back there again. But uh, that might have been the last bit of floating ice that our global economy hit. And had we paid attention to it, had we adjusted course at that time, uh, or adjusted speed anyway, that might have made a difference. And had we done something then, uh, I wouldn't be talking here, and we would, would be in a better situation. Because you know what happened to Titanic in a few years from now, <laughs> right? That thing hit its iceberg. And I would argue that in 2008 we hit our iceberg. And uh, Titanic didn't sink all of a sudden. That thing floated for two or three hours before it went in. I would argue that we're floating for six years straight now which is a mighty big achievement. <laughs> How are you going to get that thing floating for six or seven years if you spur a leak? So what caused the, the, the crisis of 2008 was that some institutions sold some debt pro uh, products to people that weren't really going to service them. So there were bad debts, right? Subprime mortgages. And they were repackaged to make them look, look good and then they were resold and resold and repackaged and the whole thing blew up because people weren't going to be servicing them. And that basically made a lot of banks fail. So we couldn't have that. So we saved those banks. Now the taxi driver that brought me here at 5 a.m. or something, if he doesn't do his job right, he goes bankrupt, right? He's out of business. He's lost his job. But those big institutions uh, selling bad debt products and repackaging them fraudulently they were safe because they were too big to fail. Now the reason why I say we sprung a leak and we're sinking ever since is that they're now too bigger to fail. Okay, so those debt products that were sold back then, they're sold again. We're reinflating that bubble. We're telling people buy a house. We're telling our students get into student loans. So uh, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of students in Spain or Italy or Greece uh, and in the Netherlands as well to a lesser degree, that have that university diploma, and that have that student debt through their lives, and they're not going to be able to serve that. So that's bad debt, you could say. We're trying to impose that to people. I read an article in a Dutch newspaper just this morning that half of the Dutch people are, are unable to to um, to service their debt. They are in trouble paying off their loans, and only 15% is, uh, is, is not in trouble, so 15, of, of that rich, rich country in the Netherlands, 15% is okay. It's only 15, yeah. Well, you know the examples of Greece and Cyprus and all, all the rest of that. So, 2008, that thing sprung a leak and we didn't fix that. Well, we, we, we threw money at it, so we kept those banks afloat. And that was a mighty big achievement. But those banks are now bigger, the debt pro uh, products are, uh, are larger, and the amount of fraud is larger. Now, if you're captain of Titanic, right, uh, and you sprung, I'm pretty sure a real captain of Titanic knew he was going to sink right after he hit his iceberg. Right, you? He knew how that thing was constructed. And you know what captains do when they hit their icebergs. 
look at the coast of Concordia off the coast of Italy, if you look at the ferry off the coast of South Korea earlier this year, where people were told to, to stay below decks, right, because it would be safer and they drowned in their cabin as the ship was sinking. Captains tell you, carry on as you were, nothing to worry about, you got it under control. Another example would be, in this story anyway, Fukushima. So the Tokyo Electric Power Company has it under control, right? You think? So they did the same routine, saying that they have it all covered. And then they had to go to plan B, saying, oh, sorry, <laughs> we weren't all that truthful. But we got it under control now. Okay. So you think they have it under control? I don't know. I have no clue. I'm, 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 I'm starting to be a little distrustful against those captains of big companies or our global economy. So ever since 2008, we're in a recovery. I've been listening to, uh, yeah, there you go. I've been listening to uh, Ben Bernanke making a speech every couple of months uh, saying we're in a recovery. How's the recovery doing? Well, I would argue that there is no recovery, but they did uh, do a good job at keeping that thing afloat. And uh, actually, I'm pretty sure I'm supposed to be happy about being afloat because you really don't want to be on that thing when it's sinking. Okay? I think the Great Depression of the 20s and the 30s last century was not a fun time. And that thing only resolved itself through war. Okay? So only after World War II did we really get to be recovering. So where does that lead us? So how did they save Titanic for the last six, seven years? How, how are we still floating? They threw massive amounts of money on that thing. And in my story, which well, it's a stretch of the imagination, maybe, but if you throw money at that thing, you increase the size of that ship, right? Global economy is bigger. They throw more money at it. They throw more debt at it. But they didn't increase the size of the engine. So if you have the same size of the engine, same economic power, same uh, economic engine, if you will, with a bigger ship, that thing slows down. And I would argue that we've come to a dead stop right around now. We're not moving forward. I mean, look at your students with their student loans and look at the people unemployed. And if you are employed, it's less hours and lower wages than what you would have had 10 years ago. So we've come to a dead stop. And they're still throwing money at that thing, increasing it. Uh, uh, Mario Draghi of the ECB, uh, just now, a week ago or something, at, at Jackson Hole, made a, some kind of announcement that next up is the European Central Bank doing some stimulus program, investing. Well, throwing debt at that ship. I'm pretty sure that debt is going to do the same as the debt that the Fed threw at the system. It's going to sink like a brick to the bottom. Because if you throw money at something, they, 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 the idea is it's going to roll. And that's good. Money that's rolling is good. That's velocity of money. Right? That's the speed that, with which it, uh, it changes hands. Uh, money is not changing hands today. Look at yourselves. Look, I'll, I'll, I'll look at myself. I try to reduce my mortgage debt and try to cut back on, on big spending. I, I, I'm afraid to buy expensive stuff and it goes for most people. Just the other day in the news, Italy is now in a, a deflationary situation. Well, there's deflation in Italy. Deflation. A, a definition of deflation might be that you, uh, that the velocity of money is reduced. People sit on their money. If they have it to spend, <laughs> you have to have it, but if you have it, you sit on that thing or you pay off your debt. And what's the solution? Throw more debt at it. That's not going to work. You want to create inflation. You want to get the economic engine going again. But the measures may not work. Well, they kept, kept us afloat. The boat's still floating. So that's a good thing, maybe. Uh, so, 2008. Is this going to work? Yeah, there you go. 2008, we hit our iceberg. This is supposed to be the iceberg that the uh, Titanic hit thing floated for a couple of hours and then went vertical, killing two-thirds of its passengers. So a, a bunch of people in first class made it to the lifeboats, um, second or third class or whatever the class were on that boat. I don't think they were that lucky. Now, on our global economy, uh, there's people looking for lifeboats as well, aren't there? There's people like myself maybe, and, and you guys out there, thinking, well, is this thing going to work at all? I mean, we're increasing the size of that ship. My feet are wet. Um, engine is not improving. Global economy coming, coming, coming to, to a dead stop. How are we on the lifeboat situation? 
and you got people moving into precious metals like gold and silver. And also you got people moving into cryptocurrencies. There's a nice piratey topic for you. You could look at that as if it were a lifeboat, a system outside of the old sinking system. Right? With your Bitcoin and your Mexcoin and your doggy coin and whatever coin you guys know them better than I do. Could be a lifeboat. I'm pretty sure on Titanic there were people telling Captain, uh, Captain, this is not going to work. Uh, the iceberg. <laughs> and you know what Captain say? Found that on the internet as well. Don't talk iceberg to me. We're doing okay. We got this thing under control, right? Carry on as you were. Nothing to worry about. So we had some people exposing the wrongdoings of the captains of our global economy. And I would count our whistleblowers among them. Okay, so it's wrongdoings that got exposed. Uh, in a way, you could argue that, that Ed Snowden and Chelsea Manning and Julian Assange are whistleblowers in this time frame, exposing the wrongdoings of a captain that really doesn't want you to know that we're sinking. Okay. But there's economic whistleblowers as well. You might want to look up uh, Andrew McGuire, who, who illustrated that the silver market is rigged. Okay. Or the gold anti Trust Action Committee, I believe, Gata looked that up. Gold market is rigged. LIBOR is rigged, we know that from, 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 uh, from newspapers. So all kinds of stuff going on, trying to keep the illusion going that we're in a recovery. Well, I beg to differ. So, what do you do when you're on a ship that's going down and you look for the lifeboat situation? Well, if you're captain, I would argue that you go build yourself a new ship, maybe. Well, there's a bit of a uh, problem, because if you're captaining that thing and you've thrown massive amounts of money on it, you are not going to write that thing off, I think. And that's also one of those things that, that uh, especially pirate parties uh, discuss about, right? In whose interest are they working, really? Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's talk up on... Uh, on uh, Copyright, I believe, on that industry. In whose interest is that? Is that in the interest of the people sailing Titanic or is that in the interest of the people owning that boat? Captain is not working for the people that elected him. He's working to keep that ship afloat for the big companies that own our global economy. So, what to do then? We're on that ship together. Well, some people are moving out of that thing, they're moving into communities not using the old system anymore. That's, that's a nice, it says brilliant ideas out there. People saying, well, stop using interest or stop using debt or whatever. I don't know if that's going to work at all. But you have brilliant ideas out there. Uh, I started voting pirates. That was my idea. I hooked up with those guys in the Netherlands earlier this year. Got off my couch. Thought, oh, I want to do something. And then all of a sudden, I'm here in Istanbul, <laughs> where these things can go. But it takes a while for pirates to get elected and to make a difference captaining that thing. And then I thought, well, what's really supporting our captain then? Oh, captain, my captain. Huh? Oh, captain, my captain. Yeah, there you go. What's, what's, what's keeping him in the captain's seat? Whiskey. <laughs> yeah, the whiskey, yeah. So basically that's, that's faith, right? That's our trust in, in them doing the right thing. That's our trust in our currencies. There's nothing backing the euro or the dollar or the whatever currency that we're currently using. The only thing backing that thing is faith, confidence by the people. So when that goes, they can throw all the money at it they want. But uh, when that thing goes. So I figured, well, that's one fun thing to do, maybe. Tell them. Hey Kevin, next time that you think you need to throw money at that thing, would you do it in a slightly different way, please? I've seen what you did since 2008. You kept us afloat. That was a mighty big achievement. But maybe next time around, uh, do it in a slightly different way. Um, if a bank is too big to fill, cut that thing up, mandatory. And by the way, start doing that now. If you have too big to fill banks, cut that thing up, mandatory. Cut those bonuses. Cut the wages until the level of an uh, elected member of parliament or something can tell him. It's not going to change anything on the short term, but you can tell him because the only thing he's got going for himself is our faith in, in those currencies and in his leadership. So, 
at least that's what I went to do. I was invited to do my talk here, so I thought, well, let's just do that. And there you go. I wrote some letters to the Dutch elected members of our parliament. Had a bit of fun doing that. This was last Sunday. I haven't heard from them since. Now the thing is, one person doesn't change anything. But if people tell their or, or, or vo voice their uh, concern and tell the current captain what he's playing with, which is your faith in his system, then that might be all the change you need. And you get these, these, these counter arguments saying, "Well, we're we going to lose the good bankers." Yeah, right. It's good. Those are the guys who were in charge in 2008, and that did not solve anything ever since. So I'd say good riddance. And in a good piratey way, I'd say, well, you pull out the plank and feel how cold the water is. Really. Okay. So that's my talk, my friends. Thanks for your attention, and uh, good luck with your lifeboats. <laughs> Take care. Can take questions here or later at the bar or whatever. Uh, just one quick one. Uh, should you show the graphs uh, showing uh, increasing inflation uh, or uh, an increase in total debt? For instance, um, the question is uh, did you uh, adjust that for changes in money supply? Because very frequently people don't do that and that means that the numbers don't. Uh, so most people will think they should adjust, but very rarely do people adjust for changes in the supply. Okay. And it turns out that uh, that actually comes with more than education. Okay. So the question is, did you, how did you come about those graphs, and did you take into account all the, uh, all the technical uh, things that, that, that you really need to take into account if you want to come up with a graph like this? Okay. So, um, uh, specifically changes in the money, changes in the money su uh, supply specifically. So, okay. The way I would answer that is um, I've been working in ICT for 20 years. I have never taken any economic or history lessons other than some books that I read over the last couple of years and, and whatever information I could uh, gather. So the graphs that, uh, that are up here are from official government bodies in the Netherlands. And the only thing I want to illustrate here is that you have this line going slightly up and then going parabolic. And however you do the measurements, uh, I, I would argue that, uh, that the course of the line doesn't change all that much. So they're not, they're not my graphs, I pirate them. Anyone else? Yeah, Hi, thank you for taking the question. And actually, you were saying that the whole concept of money is a concept of trust. And I, I would agree on it, but with a slight uh, modification of the sentence, I would say it's not only trust, but actually the standing armies behind the money, because why should I trust the US dollar more than the, than the euro, as an example? Currently, it's probably because of standing army behind it. And there goes my question to say, if we were still having the gold standard, I don't believe that would change something because um, you couldn't eat gold either. You can't eat um, the euros or dollars or lira. So the question is, shouldn't we move to a standard okay. that actually would have some utility for people owning money? So not having gold, but not mining uh, cryptocurrencies and uh, wasting power and energy and uh, whatever, but actually having a standard that would increase utility of money. Okay. So there's two questions in there. Um, the first part is about, uh, well, it's not just trust or confidence in, in a currency that, that keeps that thing being used. It's meant with guns. <laughs> and since the United States Army is the biggest army in the world, we have the most faith in that, in that well, it's not faith, it's imposed, right? <laughs> it's mandatory. Well, I suppose it's mandatory in a way. If I want to take out a job in the, in the, in the Netherlands, I, I get paid in euros on a bank account. That's pretty much the only thing that my employer really wants to do. So, you want to work? This is, this, these are the rules of the games. Uh, not necessarily 
guns involved there. But that is a that is a thing coming, right? Uh, a way to look. Gosh, we're in Turkey with with. I made the comparison this morning with with civil wars kind of situation on all pretty much all borders. Uh, some United States involvement in pretty much all of those wars. So yeah, there's a pretty strong army supporting a weakening dollar. Now, at the moment at least, we're still voting for our elected leaders, and we can make a change. I can, I think, I'm sure, that's my feeling anyway. We can make a dramatic change by casting our vote. All, all people in all democracies around, around the world. I don't know where the future leads. I mean, if, if we go vertical, there could be martial law trying to limit uh, uprisings or what, what have you. Well, there goes your democracy. So we're still floating. We might use that time. And I do not know to what solution. I'm no economist. I don't know. Uh, if anything, I think that thing is going vertical. I don't know if it's next year or next month or it's going to take another 10 years. I've, I haven't a clue. But the current course is not going to work. The only thing I am positive of is that current elected leaders and appointed bankers are not working in the interest of the people on Titanic. They're working in the best interest of the owners of that ship. So what I would change is a more ethical uh, behavior imposed on those parties. Right? If you tell those bankers, if you want to play bank, you play by these rules. You play nice. All right? And the same goes for your elected leaders. So that's, that's a voice that, 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 that the electorate could make. And where that would lead, I haven't a clue. I don't know. I think it's going to hurt a little bit more before we get better. But, uh, I can tell the future. I, I know economics, so I don't know. Okay, other questions? Hello. I would like to ask you basically two questions. Do you think that digital currencies and ICT-based economies could, in a way, um, somehow downsize the role of all these state and intergovernmental debt that's uh, been leaking. And secondly, do you think that China will eventually abuse the situation with the debt? I mean, they already are, but let's see what could we see. Okay. Thanks. Well, it's interesting you bring China up here because everything when you turn, turn on the television, it's, it's either Obama's making a statement about Russia or media making a statement about Russia. Nobody's talking China currently, but there's that, that, a big player sitting in the background currently, right? First off, on, on cryptocurrencies. Uh, somebody made a comparison not so long ago with the old system, compared them to uh, horse and carriage, or compared them to the mail system, right? I sent some letters out in the mailbox with stamps. When I did that, I had no idea if I had still stamps in my house. And I had them. They were from 2010. <laughs> Not even sure if, if they are still valid, but I used them. They are. Okay, fair enough. They are, they are more stable than modern. I didn't really care. <laughs> <laughs> They're more stable than current. Yeah. So uh, I can imagine the old system going uh, slowly, going like the like the dodo. Uh, then again, there are some mighty big people with mighty big guns supporting that old system. So they're not going to give up without a fight. And you get that. You, you get cryptocurrencies are being banned or are being made illegal or are associated with illegal behavior. Just me buying something. I bought a ticket to, uh, to a seminar in the Netherlands on September 20th, I think. It's the first thing I bought with my Bitcoin. Great. It's just a fun thing. You can do good things with that. It's just money. I can buy guns with, well, I can't, I don't know where to go. But I can buy guns with dollars or euros. Just as easy, uh, probably easier than with cryptocurrencies. I would like a, a world moving in, into that space. So in China, well, you might be aware that there's a new World Bank instituted not so long ago this year, right? A new, new IMF World Bank kind of thing between Russia, China, Brazil, uh, India, I believe, uh, South Africa. I, uh, I'm no economist. There's a new World Bank. That's a mighty big threat to the old system. Might be that that's the reason we're picking on Russia currently. Did you hear that the United Kingdom made a statement yesterday or the day before? They want Russia off the SWIFT system. It's the international paying system that's, that's, that's hosted in, in, in Belgium. It's a mighty big step moving against Russia, who's on, 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 on the front page. China's in the backside, one of the biggest owners of US dollars. Well, you might want to look up Google, Google uh, the amount of money that China has been buying 
over the last couple of years. And when I say money, I mean gold. Okay. It's the same graph. That's the same graph. Yeah, there you go. So exponential. So uh, you might want to look up uh, a Dutch blogger, Koos Janssen, who's done some excellent research on the, on the amount of gold that's being bought in China or by China. Okay. So I think they're pretty smart. One, they're not on TV. That's good. They do that better than Russia currently, I suppose. And two, they're, uh, I think the smart parties are investing in something other than old-fashioned currencies. So if that's the questions, then thank you again. And off to the next guy, or girl. Hello, everybody. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Mr. Rico, for, pre uh, for your presentation. Hopefully, this presentation will be beneficial for us. I want to say something. Uh, actually, we have six speakers for today. But uh, as you know, Mr. Paul doesn't come yet. Therefore, uh, our third speaker, uh, Mr. Richard, I can't. Uh, you might you uh, is uh, speech uh, topics is the educators need clothes towards a collaborate and open vision for education in the 21st century. about reimagining higher education in the 21st century to be something that's more collaborative and open. So we're going to talk about some projects that we ran last year and some projects that we've got in development at the moment. So the first project is called the Media Culture 2020 project. And we got some EU funding by the Lifelong Learning Intensive Programme uh, to run this project about 100,000 euros. And there were two objectives to the project. First was to demonstrate what 21st century converged and interactive European media culture could be. And the second objective was to break down classroom and campus walls by creating this open virtual learning environment where students from different countries and fields could explore and learn together. And in terms of educational purposes, this was related to the competencies and the potential benefits for learners our students like social media as their reference book today. So we aim to offer comprehensive and interrelated knowledge by sharing content and know-how, to give the skills for new forms of production, transmission and representation of content, to give value to the cultural expectations in the European community space, and to create a collective space in public. And the project included 10 professors and 40 students uh, from our University of Lincoln, Champer University of Applied Sciences in Finland, the University of Vic in Spain, uh, Utrecht School of Arts in the Netherlands, and Leopaya University in Latvia. And we used all the free and online cloud-based services that we could to develop projects. So we used Google Drive as a way of developing collaborative docs so we could work on the proposal and on the planning for the project. So I could be working in Lincoln writing and I could see my colleague writing in Finland or in the Netherlands. So we had one master copy, which is the real bonus of working with Google Drive. It allowed us to work in real time and everything was stored in the cloud. We used Google Hangout for professor meetings, we used it for lectures and workshops, again, as the benefits of being real time, and we could stream it live via YouTube and record it onto YouTube as well. So we used Facebook as a coffee room, as a kind of more relaxed place for social interaction and cultural exchange. And we used Twitter as a way of publicising uh, and the, the project. And Blogger, we use Blogger extensively to document the project. Um, when the paper is published, all the addresses will be uh, as part of that paper. So it allowed us to create this very dynamic and democratic digital learning environment. So here we are using Google Hangouts as a way of having professor meetings. So Anna's there in, in Latvia, 
Kai in Finland, our colleagues in Lincoln and in the Netherlands and Spain. And we also use Hangout as a way of delivering uh, workshops and lectures. So, as my colleague uh, delivering a workshop in Lincoln. And some of the colleagues sat around the table watching that in Finland. So, first, we had two parts of this. The first part took place in Tampere in Finland in April 2013. I'm just going to play a short video that uh, captures that uh, captures that event. Good. Okay, good, thank you. and our country is known for Barça, Gaudí, Human Towers and Tapas. We are students from Latvia, from the University of Liepāja and our country is known for Skeleton, Fast Internet, Riga Black Balsam and Opera Singers. We are Dutch students from YouTube School of the Arts. Our country is known for cheese, dikes, weed, tulips and Heineken. Hi, we're the English students from the University of Lincoln and our country is known for fish and chips, football, tea, Big Ben and the Queen. We are students from Tampere University of Applied Sciences and our country is famous for sound, ice hockey, Northern Lights, Formula One and metal music. Media 2020 project is a collaboration between five universities across Europe. Yeah, it's about bringing people together, working on a, on a certain theme and a developing concept. They can invite any device or channel or platform that is not yet here. This is just to release imagination and, and creativity. What's going to be the media in 2020 and what can we do for the media to be better than now? There's always somebody showing something and, and others are adapting that knowledge or skill. I don't really have any expectations, I was just hoping to meet a lot of new people from different countries and maybe sort of learn about the culture that's here in Finland. But also like create something from zero, come up with some cool concept that actually can happen. The final outcome of their concepts will uh, provide a vision of how the students think we will use media in, within the next seven years, so that's in 2020. We came up with this idea that you can actually tap your world and tap everything you see. One of them is a uh, augmented reality app that would allow you to go to a historical site and then you can choose how far back do you want to go in the past and then you can see holograms of what actually happened in that place 100 years ago. I think it's really important to step outside of your own university 
to be able to see different cultures, different countries, different experience and, and broaden your view in a, in a sense. And I think that makes you a better designer. What I love from Tampere, Finland is that there's a lot going on. Like a lot of startup companies. Companies like Rovio and Bambi Birds and traditional print facilities. And television studios that are looking a very forward facing, thinking to the future. So a great mix of uh, media industries, both new and old. Outside of workshops, we've been um, on lots of trips. We went to a tower and had the best donuts in Europe. We went to the sauna and did ice diving. We jumped into the lake, which was freezing. So yeah, with the other countries, every country is putting on their own night. Some of us have had presentations. Others were more focused on the games. Get to know them and get to understand a bit more about you know, sort of what food they eat, what activities they like to do in their free time. It was so much fun. I haven't been in all of them, but uh, at least that night was the best. But some of the games were a little strange. The one where you had to have the nail was... Uh, I was awesome at nail shitting, what was it? <laughs> do, do, do they play that? Play that video? Okay. It's, Fantastic to work with such motivated and active students who have come to work and learn <clears throat> as much as possible. At the end of October or beginning of November, we'll be in Lipaya University in Latvia for the production of those five concerts that are going to be the best ones we have created now in Tampere. Okay, so the students have worked together for six weeks online prior to the two weeks of coming together in Finland. And for the first workshop, they were working on some concepts, so they were kind of imagining what the media culture would look like in 2020. And then in November, a different group of students came together to try and realise those concepts. So I'll just show you a video from the second workshop. We're here in, uh, in Leopard, uh, in Latvia. Uh, we're here for the second instalment of MC 2020, which is this European project that encourages students today to consider the media landscape of the future. Uh, in April of this year, we uh, started the program in Finland, in Tampa. Uh, and the conclusions that came out of there, our students now have kind of taken on those ideas, critiqued them, broken them down, and uh, developed them further. So it's a way to learn from each other, uh, managing to get people from five different countries and professors from five different places in the world. We have uh, students coming from the Netherlands, from Catalonia, from the UK, from Finland, and from here in Latvia. This year we have uh, a number of students um, from other nations as well, uh, from South Korea, from China, uh, from Israel. Uh, so it's a real international as well as a, a European project. So over the course of two weeks, the students have uh, taken these ideas, they've split themselves into seven different groups. You have like five, six, seven, eight people in each group and everyone has to have a role. Uh, at the beginning we had a lot of brainstorming, uh, what, we're gonna, what we want to, to do, what we want to do, we, do we want to keep the last concept or we want to improve it. We talk to each other like, I'm good editing, I'm good researching and we separate the task. And this is all leading up to a, a big presentation that is uh, happening at the end of the process where they will be 
doing a live presentation um, of 10, 15 minute duration uh, to a public audience. Our concepts, like the basic idea is uh, you are human hardware and you wear the software and this allows you to connect with everyday items. With our concept, people can see the things that they couldn't see with their naked eyes. That's our basic idea. We changed a lot of our project, so that we had um, how it's now our project, it's really different. It took us ages to come around to work on the actual concept. Yeah, I mean, we have had to go to the moon and back to find the core of the idea. In my opinion, the point we were stopped was that whenever we found some other people already done like similar ideas. At first, we were uh, such a big group, so we didn't manage to get ideas or we were like giving rounds to the same thing over time. And after a couple of days, we um, were so into our projects and into the direction we were going that we made it too precise. We, we were already talking about you know how to make it, how to brand it, how to distribute it, where it will be bought, where it will be placed. We even had a price of like the Exactly, like that's way too precise. I'd say the, the seminars um, kind of made you think about all the different things like privacy um, that we might not have considered um, because we're thinking so visionary. But um, yeah, they're quite inspiring and they made us, yeah, made us really think about where our concept was going in the future rather than just developing it now. It happened like pretty quickly after that that we, we got the idea together and we could leave all the all the clutter from around like just leave it behind and yeah, we had, it's because we had so much research done beforehand that when we came to say you know we need to start work right now we knew exactly where to start and what to do. I think the culture evenings were a really integral part of the process here. It was really good to get an insight on sort of the cultures from the other countries that are here. I know they're very brief, but they were they were really fun to take part in the activities that you want to take part in in your own country. kind of happening because we were here already for at least seven days, mostly only seeing the building where we worked. Uh, and the only route I knew in this town was from the university to the hotel. So it was really nice to see the city and just be able to see the landscape and the surroundings, but at least know where you are. Yeah, and when people get to know each other and start to like come along, it also helps the working here because you know the person, you know how to talk to him. But in my opinion, I think that the best connecting cultures moment were when we were all in the bar and talking freely and really interacting with no pressure or nothing. I think that all the group members, uh, we are like really happy about the end results. Maybe we miss sometimes so we could have evolved more, but we are Pretty confident. Uh, I think I, I, I can explain my network connection here. I met a lot of people with like really talented people. And it's extremely fun to sit in a room with 40 people who are all just as creative but all in different directions yeah. and different subjects, with different knowledge, different backgrounds. It's, it's a really nice environment to work in. I, I, I really liked the question in one time that was do you feel there is a European culture or how uh, European do you feel and uh, by going to this project MC 2020 I feel really like a European I mean everyone from Europe is here almost it feels like that and it ends up that not only European cultures because I'm from I'm not European for example I'm from Israel and uh, we have a lot of people not from their home country that mix up into the European culture and everything I think it's something about Europe nowadays that it's not only about European people anymore it's about being international uh, the world is really small and we all need to know each other and, and just understand each other.
So, what did we find as part of these projects? Well, we found that real interaction, not surprisingly, is still important in the network zero. So some of the best times, even though we've done lots and lots of work online, using social networks, etc., still getting people together is one of the key things. They allowed us to have this very floating approach to giving advice and support to students that we were able to just kind of float around the room and chat to them. And when needed, we were able to give them uh, more uh, direct advice in terms of the work they were producing. And we were able to do presentations to support them in terms of developing their own presentations. And as you saw from the videos, the cultural, cultural events were just as important, if not more important, than the hard work that they were doing. So here we have a Finnish uh, hobby, I think it is, of wife carrying. And the students got to put on se um, separate nights where they were able to produce uh, a taste of their own country. I think this again is Finland. Of course, the oldest drop of alcohol is always a successful criteria. And as we hurtled towards the end of the second project, pizza became an ever-increasing uh, mainstay. So at the end of the uh, both projects, the pitched the projects to a public and expert audience to give them a good opportunity to go through that, that pitching process. And they received some critical feedback from the public and from some of the experts in the audience. And on reflection, uh, we found the intensity of the programme in such a short period of time was a big challenge for the students' incentive. So for future editions, we would rather therefore concentrate on further development of the intercultural concept thinking and on a strong relationship of the conceptual achievements. So, CoLab Project 1, um, so after the successful uh, MC2020 projects, we explored the opportunities to implement and embed some of the best practices of the project at the University of Lincoln. So we put together a successful proposal for a collaborative interdisciplinary teaching and learning project called CoLab Project 1, that involves students and staff from the School of Media, my school, and the School of Art and Design. And this uh, tied in very much with the student as producer concept, which uh, is a Lincoln, University of Lincoln uh, initiative. So student as producer is a groundbreaking project at the University of Lincoln that reconnects higher education's core activities of teaching and research, transforming how students see their place in the academic community. And the core concept of the project is research to engage teaching. This means encouraging students at all levels and across all disciplines see themselves as active producers of knowledge rather than passive consumers. So this is another short video. This is Mike Neary, Professor Mike Neary from the University of Lincoln. It's the last time I'm down to do this music in the My research is about academic labour and student life, particularly in the context of the, the future of higher education. And in that context, I'm interested in designing alternative forms of higher education. Professor Mike Neary, Dean of Teaching and Learning. The student producer begins from the idea that the two core activities of higher education work against each other, research and teaching. So is it possible to re-engineer that relationship between research and teaching in a way in which students become a, a core part of the academic culture of the university. We've been working on that now for the last three or four years as a research project and what we've been doing is redesigning the curriculum across the university so there's more research and research-like activity and then we've been writing about that and reviewing and then evaluating it. And it's been very successful Quality Assurance Agency came in last year to do a review on the whole university's teaching and learning provision. The student's producer was highly commended. 
And what that means is that a uh, student produces is regarded as being having impact and being influential across the whole university sector, both nationally uh, and internationally. Institutionally, it is now the teaching and learning strategy for the whole university, which is um, quite an achievement over three years. And what we find is, while student produce has been taken up here at the university, it's also been taken on in various ways by other universities. We recently had an international conference here at Lincoln to mark the end of the three-year project and there were more than a hundred participants from universities from all over the world and including students. And what was so encouraging about that to see how Student Producer has taken off really uh, as, a, as an approach to um, higher education and to hear other academics and students research where they are using the practicals and principles of um, of students as producers, so that was very, very exciting. <clears throat> so, student as producer emphasizes the role of students as collaborators. They're given opportunities to work with academics, postgraduates and support staff on real academic research. In this way, students become part of the academic project of the university and make a meaningful contribution to the production of knowledge alongside experienced researchers. So, after our successful MC 2020 projects, we uh, formed CoLab uh, at the University of Lincoln. This was an exciting interdisciplinary transmedia project that sought to explore and develop new approaches to collaborative teaching and learning. It was an opportunity to work on a project that blurred the boundaries of specialised skill and knowledge learning that took place in May this year. And again it was a blended learning project, so we had two weeks of pre-workshop activities that happened online, we had one week intensive workshop and then ongoing post-workshop activities. And again we used free cloud-based tools Google Docs and Hangouts, use Blogger to document the process, use Facebook for social interactions, and Twitter as a way of publicising the project. So we had a Facebook page that was set up, and we had the CoLab blog, so again the, doc the project is um, documented extensively on the blog, so we'll give you that address. And again, it allowed us to create this very dynamic and uh, democratic digital learning environment. So the students were given a topic, uh, the topic was drones, uh, they were given a, a kind of keynote lecture to introduce them to that subject, but they were allowed to run with that subject as they saw fit. What we saw happening was this very participatory, very energetic uh, experience for the students. And here we see uh, Google Hangout being new, so we have Chris Hader from the Hague University of Applied Sciences in the Netherlands giving a talk to our students in Lincoln. <coughs> And again, we had this very kind of floating uh, approach to giving feedback to students and kind of just went around the room giving advice as and when needed. And it allowed them to really kind of embrace this opportunity to work together and also work in, in the cloud as well. And it allowed them to become collaborators in the production of knowledge and not just passive receivers of knowledge. Just another short video. So this is the video from the CoLab projects at the University of Lincoln that kind of captures the essence of the project. The whole idea behind CoLab is about engaging 
creative practices across the different schools within the College of the Arts. The brief is, is open to interpretation, is open to the demands of what students want to create and um, how their creative practices actually lead them towards new ideas. At the moment we see that these courses are fairly siloed off. Each of the course has their own specialism, has their own approaches to practice. Um, and we wanted to see what would happen if we experimented and tried to um, cross boundaries. So this is an interdisciplinary project um, and it is something which we see as trying to pilot a new approach to learning and teaching. CoLab project came about as a result of uh, a, a, a wider project that we undertook last year. It was part of the Media Culture 2020 project, which was in the Erasmus funded project. We love the idea of the model of grabbing students from different disciplines, bringing them together, setting them a core brief, and getting them to work on it. Uh, the ideas that came out of it weren't necessarily the primary focus of the project. It was how they collaborated, how they formed relationships uh, inside and outside of the workshop. And we really like that model. Uh, we believe that collaboration should be a bigger part of the university's uh, sort of strategy and in the future it is set to become part of the future strategy and at the moment it doesn't really happen. I got involved by um, I did media production and I saw posters up and everything and so I thought it would be a great chance to get to know other um, people from other courses because a lot of the people here didn't even know anything about their course so it's great to collaborate with different people. I've seen that you can use everyone's skills and like work them together even if people have totally different skills you can um, combine everything and get the most out of everyone and sometimes just being in your set skill area is like bad for you because you end up being um, quite narrow and strict with the work you're doing rather than like expanding it out. And by working with everyone else, you get to you kind of get a different insight into the way they might think about a problem and the way you think about it. The whole topics about drones and stuff for this week and it's been really exciting they're getting to know what exactly a drone is and how they're perceived in the media. We got to see some and actually uh, try and fly some drones the other day and it was uh, really cool we had. We've just been jumping about in the Oculus Rift, uh, almost falling over, and yeah, experiencing virtual reality, essentially, yeah. We just, just have a look at a TED, TED talk about uh, virtual reality and augmented reality. Uh, we've been talking about uh, technologies in the sense of mapping out 3G uh, worlds. Yes, yeah, it's yeah. amazing what, what we've been learning, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's brilliant. Uh, we're not just having fun with the fact of playing with new technologies, it's the meeting with new people, collaborating with people who I potentially would never have met in the university if it wasn't for this, and learning about what they do and how they can help us and it, yeah, it's amazing. Another great thing that's come out of this is the, as a kind of teaching team, uh, we've found uh, time out from our timetable activities to discuss what we're doing, uh, develop ideas, and there's a lot of great potential of where we can bring this model to other parts of our course, but to the university as a whole, and maybe even uh, nationally or internationally. Okay, so the students were um, able to present their findings from the workshop at a conference um, called Asimov and so below at the university. So they produced posters that they presented as part of, uh, of an academic conference. So we have some future collab projects. In September we will uh, visit the Academy of Pop Culture in Groningen in the Netherlands to do collab Netherlands. 
We've got some other presentations, some more projects in the UK. We'd love to do a collab in Istanbul or a collab anywhere else in the world, given the opportunity to do that, so we could come out there and do an intensive project with some of the students. So, the next project that we have decided to develop on from the two successful projects is called Scholar. So inspired by our experiences, we propose to develop Scholar, which is a comprehensive integrated software environment that supports the development, delivery, assessment and administration of education courses. It provides a modifiable tool set that can be used to foster collaborative forms of blended learning within the classroom and online. So these are the initial mock-ups of what Scholar will look like. It will be, it'll be platform neutral, it will across all platforms. It will be cloud-based. It will allow us to move away from using other services such as the Google services. And the model for Scholar will rely heavily on promoting social interaction as a key part of its learning support strategy. Frictionless sharing will encourage collaboration and make it easy for the knowledge and learning to be multifaceted rather than teacher to student dialogue. And we're designing Scholar to be simple, intuitive, smart and connected so this will ensure it's easy to learn as it will build on existing conventions of social media networks. So there will be a familiarity of design that learners are already familiar with. And what we're trying to do is produce something that's fit for purpose for today's, uh, for today's learners. We're not only using computers, we're increasingly using smartphones and tablet devices as a way of connecting with the world, with each other, and hopefully with their learning experience. And the existing uh, virtual learning environment, such as Blackboard and Moodle, are not fit for purpose for the social networks or risk connected smartphone savvy students of today. They offer no enhancement to the learning experience or to the attainment of learning outcomes. So with Scholar we're focusing, focusing functionality around how learners engage best with content and facilitating collaborative and social connections. Scholar will provide an interactive learning ecosystem that is centred around individual learners. So in conclusion, the blend of both synchronous and asynchronous teaching methods foster an open blended learning environment, one that extends beyond the traditional boundaries of the classroom in time and space. Digital tools enable staff and students to communicate and strengthen social ties alongside participation in the production of new knowledge and media content. For students and professors, the implementation of social media and cloud platforms offers an innovative solution to teaching and learning in a collaborative manner. By leveraging the interactive and decentralised capabilities of a range of technologies in an educational, educational context, this model of digital scholarship facilitates an open and dynamic working environment. And these models of collaborative pedagogy can be appropriated to extend the traditional boundaries of the classroom and encourage a more participatory, collaborative and open vision for education in the 21st century. And finally, and this really is the end, we have uh, a new project that has just come on, on board called OnCreate. Um, this is a strategic partnership of creative processes in online collaboration with a consortium of 10 European partners. The OnCreate proposal is about the exchange, implementation and evaluation of processual and contextual knowledge of online collaborative courses with a focus on creation and innovation. And we have these are the 10 partners, so we have uh, ourselves in, in the UK, three partners in Germany, three in Finland, one in Denmark, one in Slovenia, and one in the south of Turkey. And again, we've got some EU funding by the Erasmus Plus Strategic Partnerships Programme, so we've got 450,000 euros this time. And what we're trying to do is that study programmes today follow blended learning or even pure online approaches are becoming increasingly popular in higher education. Two main drivers for this development are increasingly international corporations among universities and industry partners and the special requirements of students in continuing education programmes. So the primary innovation aspects of OnCreate will be to uh, look at online collaborative creativity, focus on processes and social context, bringing together higher education research and user experience design, evaluations as a means of information and improvement, and builds on prior practical collaboration experiences with partners in both internal and international projects. And the future? Well, the future is there is a lot of potential for further collaborative projects under the EU Erasmus Plus and Horizon 2020 funding streams, and we are continually looking for future potential partners to join us. Thank you. Oh, the future project.
projects. Uh, any questions to Richard about his and his university's innovative projects? Uh, as a pirate, I'm quite worried about the privacy applications of using Google, Google products. Will Scholar truly replace all the Google products you have used so far? Yeah, I completely agree with you. This, this is the reason why we're going to build something it's completely bespoke. We're going to build it from scratch up so we can move away from the reliance on uh, using Google uh, services. I mean, they're there, they're great, they're free, but there are those issues in terms of privacy. And, you know, Google are a big corporation and. Um, We'd like to build something ourselves and give it away for free, and uh, I hope that will address those issues. Very good, thank you. <laughs> well, Richard, actually, I want to just add one thing about the uh, pop culture. Uh -huh. uh, should we think about the virtual pop culture? to create a new pop culture for the virtuality, even with the reality. We, our students and professors using all that devices, you can see it. So, is it possible to define the pop culture or separate the pop culture and virtual pop culture? In education, actually. I don't think it's possible to separate it. I think we have to kind of embrace it in a way moving forward in terms of the students today and uh, as do the professors. We all use all these technologies and all these platforms and the way to really move forward in terms of education for the 21st century is that we need to embrace those platforms and use them in terms of learning and, and teaching. I can accept that. Okay. <laughs> well, anyone? I think everybody is starving, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so they don't think about this. Uh, so, no, that's it. Thank you. Thank you.